Welcome to the Future of International Development, a program presented on behalf of the Ismaili Juma Kanan Center's virtual series. My name is Benoush and I serve in a voluntary capacity as the member for communications and outreach on the Ismaili Council for the Southeastern United States. The Ismaili Jamaat Kanads around the world are more than places of worship and spiritual search. These spaces hope to encourage community engagement and broaden our intellectual horizons. Love thy neighbor. The sentiments expressed in these three simple words are expressed and reflected in, in all faiths. Globally, there have been significant progress in development. More than 1 billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty since the 90s, with major gains in health and education and other areas that improve the quality of human life. However, the world still faces considerable challenges and the pandemic has only brought upon us many more. In today's program, we will engage in conversations with three leading international development organizations, the Aga Khan Foundation, Oxfam, and UNICEF. This program is in recognition of World Humanitarian Day, and we are paying special tribute to those heroes who have committed their lives to helping people all around the world. I'm delighted to introduce you to the moderator for this program, Sharina Ibrahim. Sharina is the chairman of the Aga Khan Foundation USA National Committee. Welcome, Sharina. Thank you so much for having me. I am so honored to be able to moderate this session today. Uh, and as uh, you've said, we are very, very fortunate to have three very distinguished and very experienced individuals with us today for today's discussion. So without further ado, let me introduce who they are. We have Fatima Sumar, who is the Vice President of Global Programs at Oxfam, where she oversees Oxfam's America's Regional Development and Humanitarian Response. Fatima holds a Bachelor of Arts in Government from, from Cornell University and a Master's in Public Affairs from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School. We also have Dr. Jeremy Cole, who is Managing Director of the Southeast Region, UNICEF USA. He is responsible for the overall strategic direction of the Southeast region, overseeing major gifts, special events, and community outreach efforts. Jeremy holds a BA in religion from Oberlin, an MA in religion from the University of Georgia, and a doctor of philosophy from Georgia State University. And we finally have, but last but not least, uh, Khalil Sharif, who is the CEO of the Aga Khan Foundation in Canada and the USA. He has been with the Aga Khan Foundation since 2005 and has cultivated his interest in international development and conflict resolution since he was at Harvard. Khalil holds a BA in international relations and in economics from the University of British Columbia and a JD from Harvard Law School. A huge welcome and a big thank you for all of you being here with us today. To kick off our program today, as we celebrate World Humanitarian Day, may I ask each of you to briefly provide some background on your organization, the type of work you do, the countries you're engaged in, the areas of development that you, you focus on? And maybe we uh, we start with Fatima. So hi, Sharina. It's great to see all of you. It's great to spend time with Khalil and Jeremy here on World Humanitarian Day. Thanks so much for the Smiley Council for having Oxfam on to join. And I just wanted to say um, on behalf of World Humanitarian Day, where we're really honoring all those humanitarian aid workers that have either been killed or injured in the course of providing life-saving aid around the world. Just a huge thank you to all of our humanitarian workers out there, to them and their families and their loved ones. You know, we all appreciate, especially during COVID, how incredibly difficult this work is today and every day. So thank you for putting this really incredible program together on World Humanitarian Day. Um, Sharina, I thought maybe just for a moment, just to scene set a little bit as we think about the work that all of us are doing and um, really our life's work in so many ways. You know, Benoush gave a great introduction to kind of scene set for us where we are, the progress we've made to fight extreme poverty all around the world. And you know, today we've made a lot of progress and we're really proud of that progress. But unfortunately, more than 700 million people still live in extreme poverty. 
So that's the equivalent, when we think about that, of twice the population of the United States, right? Around 10% of the world. The majority of these people live in Africa, south of the Sahara, and in South Asia. You know, it's projected that hundreds of millions of people will still be living in extreme poverty by 2030. And the majority of these will be women and girls. So we know that this is the context that we're all living and working in. And it's why organizations such as the ones we have today, including Oxfam, are really proud of the life-saving work that we're doing. We talk a lot about poverty. I wanna introduce our audience also to another way to think about these as we have this conversation today. And that's also thinking about extreme inequality because that is also the context of what we're facing and what organizations like Oxfam are doing all around the world. You know, while nearly half of humanity scrapes on by by less than $5.50 a day, the world's 2,200 billionaires, so 2,200 billionaires, have more wealth than 4.6 billion people combined, right? Just to process that again, 2,200 people in the world have more wealth than 4.6 billion people combined. That's the world we live in today. That's the state of extreme inequality, and that's one of the drivers of poverty all around the world today. And what we're seeing is COVID-19 really exacerbating these inequalities, with the poorest people really being impacted most by the loss of jobs and income. So, Sharina, organizations like Oxfam know that when pandemics like COVID hit, it's really felt unequally, right? Yeah. Those who already were the weakest links, uh, those who are already suffering the most are gonna suffer, the, or suffer even more. Yeah. And that's here in the United States and all around the world, with women and girls really facing the brunt of that um, because they always face a disproportionate share of the burden in crises like this. So what we're seeing with COVID-19 today is that it's really the final straw for so many people that are already struggling um, and it's really the final straw for so many that are struggling with the impacts of conflict, climate change, inequality, and a broken food system that has impoverished millions of food producers and workers. So organizations like Oxfam are partnering with more than 14 million people in more than 60 countries and here in the United States to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in vulnerable communities and to support basic needs and livelihoods. Oxfam is a global organization our mission is really simple, but I always say profound. It's to fight the injustice of poverty. And I want to put the emphasis on the word injustice here, because when we say the word injustice, it means, Sharina, a rights-based approach, right? That poverty is man-made. We create poverty every single day in the choices that we make as citizens, as consumers, as voters, right? We create a world that has extreme poverty we can choose to create a world that doesn't have it as well. So Oxfam has more than 70 years of experience working in this field. We work in more than 90 countries where we reach tens of millions of people directly every year. We really think po poverty is solvable, right? The, you know, you, you, you may hear in the next hour a lot of depressing statistics. The most uplifting thing I hope you hear and take away is that we can solve this. We can solve this immediately, actually, in the choices that we take. And we can fight it in three specific ways. First is helping people build better futures for themselves. The second is holding power, the powerful accountable. I'm talking here about governments, corporations. And the third is saving lives in disasters. And I'm really proud that we get to work in all three of those, in all those um, spaces. So the last thing, Shreen, I just want to leave you with as we think about this conversation and why it's so important today is that we're really living in a world where we have to focus more and more on resiliency, right? Yeah. We're faced with constant challenges, constant crises. It feels like we've just solved this one and now we're moving on to others that are just coming right behind. And in each of those, it's really the intersections of all of these crises together, whether it's things like gender, climate, hunger, global pandemics, it's really the intersection of all of these together. And that's really the work Oxfam is doing, is looking at an intersectional systems-based approach that really tackles the root causes of poverty. And that is both incredibly difficult, complex, and incredibly empowering all at the same time, because if you can tackle those root causes, right, then you should see less and less symptoms of poverty abound um, in the world that we live in. 
So thanks again, Trina, for having me on and really excited for this discussion today. Excellent. That was a great overview. Uh, Jeremy, can I ask you to go next, please? Absolutely. And I want to echo uh, uh, what Fatima said. Thank you, Sharina and Benoush, uh, for inviting UNICEF and for, to me to this panel and to my esteemed colleagues. A warm greeting to Fatima and Khalil. I don't want to repeat um, what Fatima was saying. I want to uh, hopefully just um, augment it, agree with everything she said about the world's inequities, about the need for systemic change. I think I would start, uh, before I talk about UNICEF for a minute, with my scene setting to add to Fatima's uh, great scene setting to say we really do live at a critical moment uh, in our history, I would say, uh, as humanity. It's in, in so many ways with this pandemic. Um, but I would focus in on one. You could argue there's this big fork in the road we can take with this pandemic. Um, COVID can make us retreat into our holes, into our own nations, into our own communities. We're at home, we're socially distant um, from each other. And we might um, use that social distance to then distance ourselves from the problems of the world. But I think that's the wrong fork. Uh, UNICEF, Oxfam, Aga Khan Foundation, and many others, I think, believe that that's the wrong fork to take, that we need to take the, 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 the fork in the road that really recognizes this moment as a moment where we are experiencing a shared and vulnerable humanity where our children in this country in the United States are home from school, just like the over 1 billion children in the developing world um, are home from school, uh, where we are facing a virus that uh, it, we do not know how to uh, uh, beat yet. We hope soon we will. But just like many families uh, face diseases that they don't have medicines or access to medicines uh, for um, in the developing world. And so this can be a a moment of a window rather than a wall for us to work together um, as a global community. And I hope we'll talk more about that in this discussion. Um, and I would add to that that as uh, you know, capital, money, people, and viruses cross borders, um, we've also got to talk about philanthropy crossing borders. Um, we do a good job in this country. This country is so generous in the United States, um, but only 6% of giving gives global. And I can talk more about that later. But I think we can meet the moment uh, with philanthropy crossing borders in a more robust way, in the same way that our viruses and our people and our money are crossing borders. So that's sort of my scene setting. Um, in terms of UNICEF, I wanted to just start with a very brief uh, story. Um, you know, UNICEF is all about helping to save and protect and nurture the lives of every single child uh, that's in need in the world. We're in over 190 countries and territories around the world. Uh, like Oxfam, we've been do we've been at this work for over 70 years. Uh, we've got a level of expertise and focus in working on children's rights um, that's really unparalleled. And I, I, it's always good to uh, not just talk about the statistics, we'll be talking about that, but also talk about the stories of young children. And I, I wanted to start with the story of a young girl I heard recently um, who's from Syria. She lost her leg. Um, um, in Syria during the war, she was forced to flee with her family to uh, Zatari refugee camp, where I was uh, actually visited last November. And um, she was asked what her dreams were. Um, when she got to Zatari, UNICEF was there to provide her with clean water, education, the ability to feel safe. And, and we asked her, what are your dreams? And she said three things. One, I want to move to Canada because that's where my aunt lives and my family. Two, I want a new prosthetic limb. And three, I want a bed of my own. And the good news is that two of those three wishes have been granted. She has resettled with her family to her aunt's home in Canada, um, and she has a bed of her own. Um, the third wish of uh, receiving a prosthetic limb uh, has not been achieved yet, but hopefully that will be soon. But I tell her story because uh, if you think about Safa, a young refugee girl who had to flee, lived through war, lost her le leg in a bombing, had to flee with her family, live in a refugee camp, re resettled to Canada. That is an unsettled life. Um, and yet she shows us through her dreams of just wanting a bed of her own. And now that she's in Canada, she wants just to go to school, go back to school in the midst of this pandemic. She shows us what I would call relentless optimism. And I think we at UNICEF and all of us in this work have to meet this moment of being relentlessly optimistic, just like the children that we work with are. And so UNICEF is all about, really, Safa is a great example. You know, we're all about building a world. We believe, I would say, in three things. One, we, if you build a world that works for children, you're building a world 
that works for all of us. And so if we build a world that protects and nurtures a young girl like Safa, then we'll have a, she will have a chance to achieve her dreams, to not live in poverty as she grows up, to have better educational outcomes for her children, to have better economic productivity for her community. Number two, we believe in a world where you can't save a, a child from a waterborne disease like cholera, only to have them die from something like HIV AIDS or measles. And so uh, child well-being is all about a holistic perspective, much like Fatima was talking about. And number three, for UNICEF, we believe in the idea of a multi-layered approach. You've got to work at the community level, grassroots level, all the way up to the government level so that you can both pilot new projects, but also scale those projects up to make maximum impact. And so that's the work that UNICEF has been doing in education, water and sanitation, child protection, and more for over 70 years. Um, so thank you again for the opportunity to talk more about this. Thank you. That was a, that was really a big story. Thank you, um, uh, Khalil. <clears throat> Thanks, Sharina. Uh, it's a real delight and a real privilege to be part of this uh, conversation. Uh, and let me maybe I start by just picking up the themes that uh, have already been uh, put on the table so well by uh, my colleagues, which is that we are gathering at a moment of. Uh, not only change, but um, a moment when so many important uh, truths about our global situation are being put into sharp relief. And um, uh, the one word that hasn't come up yet, although it's been suggested, is um, this idea of marginalization. And I thought I might just spend a minute on it because I think one of the things that has become very, very clear uh, as the world has grappled with the crisis of COVID is that um, uh, it matters a lot uh, if you have access to support, to institutional and other kinds of support. And if you are marginalized from that support, you are going to suffer a lot. And if you are close and have access to that kind of support, uh, you have a very, very good chance of weathering this COVID crisis. And um, this has become... Uh, I think really clear to us because COVID is something you just cannot deal with alone. We've seen societies uh, who can rally around um, and mobilize healthcare institutions and healthcare knowledge be able to deal with the health consequences of this. We have seen those societies who are able to provide strong educational institutions to be able to pivot very rapidly. Uh, to uh, a different modality of providing education, be able to provide support to students. Uh, and of course, we've seen societies around the world who have the ability to provide economic support during these times, uh, support their citizens to weather this storm, and other societies who simply have not been able to do that. And so I do think that one of the truths that we're confronted by um, is the very urgent need for us to identify and understand the nature of marginalization that has been uncovered anew by the crisis. And therefore, to renew our agenda for institutional development, such that the marginalized in the world no longer live in a situation where they do not have access to the institutions they need in order to advance and to safeguard whatever gains they've been able to make. Um, and that, I guess, is a, a, a segue into talking a bit about the Aga Khan Foundation because, I mean, uh, uh, the Aga Khan Foundation is a global development agency working um, in uh, countries in Africa and Asia um, in mostly poor and marginalized places. Um, we are part of a global uh, family of agencies known as the Aga Khan Development Network, the AKDN, um, that has for over a century really thought hard about this question of institutions. So we run programs like everyone else does um, in the development sector. But I think one of the things that we do uh, that is um, uh, such an important part of our ethos is that we think hard about building permanent local institutions that can become an indefinite part of the institutional support system that marginalized communities have to draw upon at both times of crisis, but also um, at times of, uh, of opportunity. And one of the biggest drivers we feel of volatility in the developing world is the absence of ongoing, reliable, competent, high quality institutional supports to allow people to pursue um, their own aspirations and dreams for themselves, for their families, for their communities. Um, 
Now, partly this is driven because the AKDN itself uh, is a creature of um, the Ismaili imamate. His Highness the Aga Khan is the um, imam of the uh, global Ismaili Muslim community. And the AKDN institutions have been established as part of an exercise of the mandate of that office. And he has talked about this idea that the mandate of the office itself requires him to act on an ancient ethical impulse to contribute to the human development of societies um, um, in which the Ismaili community lives and, and elsewhere, um, and to think hard, not just about helping, but helping in a way that preserves and advances human dignity, that preserves and advances the idea of agency and self-reliance, that people themselves need to be able to have a measure of control, practical and psychological control, over the course of destiny that their lives are going to be um, uh, uh, taking, um, and that this be done in a genuine sense of partnership across all kinds of uh, divides. Um, uh, one of the beautiful things that His Highness has talked about um, is uh, he said that a core principle of the imamate's work is replacing walls that divide with bridges that unite. And Jeremy talked about this already, but this is another idea around marginalization because partly what we're being called to do, I think in this moment, is to build bridges across divides of marginalization, some of which we always knew about, some of which frankly, we knew about and would like to have, uh, have tried to ignore, and others which frankly have come into sharp relief sometimes for the very first time as a result of this crisis. But I do think that this is, might be a common ethic that we can all share now, that this idea of marginalization and of allowing people to build institutions that they can rely on so that they are no longer marginalized from the support systems they need to advance on all the issues that COVID is now raising for us has to be a core global priority. I think it is certainly for the AKDN system. Great. Well, thank you so much. And maybe just picking up on that, because each of you in, in different ways have mentioned this multidisciplinary need, if you will, to address the different uh, plights that we're, we're facing. And I'd love to just explore, spend a little bit of time with what we're seeing in the world right now. Uh, you know, I think, Jeremy, you, you've mentioned the refugee crisis. You know, Fatima, we've talked about injustices for women and children and food. Um, and, and how are you seeing uh, your organizations, governments, et cetera, you know, really coming together to try to address um, you know, any one of these, we don't have to get into all of them, but I'd love to just get, dig into a little bit more, how are organizations working and should be working, Yeah, you know, to, to pick up on this theme a bit more. Uh, and so maybe we start with you, Jeremy, this time uh, to begin with. Yeah, thank you for the question. And also thank you for Khalil for sort of setting up the conversation about institu institution strengthening, because that's great. And I want to talk more about that. Um, I think, you know, the, the smartest international development work, um, you know, it's it, a repeat of what I just said before. It's really a multi-layered approach. I mean, it's certainly not a top-down approach. We know that from years of failure and coming in from the West or, or other places and telling local communities what to do. So um, engaging local communities in their own solutions, in our case, that's engaging youth in their own solutions. Um, you know, just to give an example of that, we've, we've got a program called You Report that we set up at UNICEF that allows young people through their cell phones, because a lot of uh, families living in poverty may not have a lot, but they may have a simple cell phone in the developing world. They can sign up through their cell phone to this text message based uh, platform that allows UNICEF to then push out public health messages, but also to survey uh, children about their needs. And it turns out when you ask children at the grassroots level, where do you feel unsafe in school? What are the gaps in your, in your health care in your community? And you collect those data, you get better outcomes when you make decisions based on what youth are saying about their own challenges. Um, so you gotta be at the grassroots level. But you can't just be at the grassroots level because then you're only going to the, the scale up is going to be an issue. And that really gets to the institutional, um, you know, uh, wonderful conversation that was just set up. I mean, we've got to have both governments and the private sector involved such that um, we're able to pilot uh, initiatives. But then they can be taken on uh, by nations, governments, as well as you know, public private sector partnerships within those countries 
so that ultimately a UNICEF goes out of business. So we don't want to be around in these countries for decades. We want to enable the, these countries, in our case for children, to realize an investment in scaling up impactful work for children is the best way to go. And so if you approach it, uh, I had a colleague in UNICEF China who, who, who said um, in our China office who called it muddy boots on the table for UNICEF. So we've got muddy boots because we're on the ground in local communities. 80% of our staff works in the countries where we are. Um, but we also put those boots on the table and we go to the prime ministers, we go to the you know ministers of education and health and we say, look, this initiative is working. It's worked in 10 communities. Let's make it work uh, throughout the country. So among many answers, that's one of the big ones is a multi-layered approach to institution building. Great. Any ad ads from uh, Fatima or, or Khalil? Well, well, maybe I'll just come in on, um, you know, I love, you know, actually, Jeremy, you talked about um, relentless optimism, which I'm going to borrow that phrase going forward. I really love love how you phrase that. And then clearly you talk a lot about marginalization. So, so maybe just to talk a little bit about applying both of those to what we're seeing today and, and playing out during COVID. You know, I'm actually going to go back a few years though, before we talk about COVID, just to remind ourselves where we're all, you know, where we're coming from as we think about global pandemics. So it was just a few years ago, right, that we were looking in, in places like in West Africa, around Ebola, for instance, or looking at even further back HIV AIDS pandemics. Um, in Africa. And, you know, we have so many lessons learned of what works, what doesn't work as we think about public health and fighting these types of diseases. And one of the most simple but um, compelling things we've learned is that inclusion matters, right? So Khalil, you talked about marginalization. Well, let me unpack that a little bit in, in a specific context of what we're talking about here. So we learned during the Ebola crisis in West Africa a few years ago that you can't fight Ebola if you don't really understand the needs of women and girls. You don't understand the needs of women and girls if they're excluded from all the institutions on the ground, including all the public health ministries, uh, which is what you've seen take place in many places around the world, including in West Africa. You can't really address the needs of a, of a disease like Ebola unless you also understand the intersections with violence against women and girls, which takes place in many of these contexts as well, right? And so we have a lot of lessons learned from previous outbreaks about the importance of inclusion, of the importance of really making sure women and girls are represented in so many ways, both formal institutions, to Khalil's point, but also informally in the community for their voices to be recognized, heard, and championed by multiple stakeholders. So if you fast forward a little bit, even before COVID hit, you're seeing the challenges women and girls face uh, worldwide in so many different ways, whether you're talking about violence against women, whether you're talking about education. Well, but let me throw something else on the table that we we're also talking about because it comes up with COVID as well. So we knew um, before COVID hit that women and girls put in the bulk of the work around the house every day for millions and millions of households, right? I'm sure it's happening in some of your own households here on the screen um, and it's happening all around the world. Well, let's quantify that for a moment, right? It's what we at Oxfam are calling unpaid care, right? So women and girls, we know from our reporting at Oxfam, put in about 12 and a half billion hours of unpaid care work every single day, right? Um, that's a contribution. Now, if we value that societally, if society actually put a money amount to that and valued that care, it would come out to almost $11 trillion a year, economic value all around the world. Just to put this in context, that's over three times the size of the world's tech industry, right? So women and girls are putting in tons and tons of input and value all around the world, but it's not monetarily valued by the way our society does that. And we know that during COVID, that unpaid care work has increased dramatically for them. Right, taking care of children who are now home from schools, taking care of sick and their elderly relatives or sick relatives. Um, that maybe they're out of work, formal, the formal work, maybe they've lost their jobs, um, helping pay the bills. A lot of eviction rates are now coming up, right, in terms of rents and mortgages not being able to get paid. So we know that women and girls are, are facing a burden that was dramatic before COVID with all the challenges and is certainly even more dramatic today. 
as we think about this, as we think about the majority of people that are living in poverty are women and girls all around the world. They have less income, fewer assets than men, they compromise the greatest proportion of the world's poorest households, and we know that the proportion is growing. We also know that during COVID, um, we are not yet seeing strategies that really talk about that marginalization, right? They're quite broad-based strategies, and they're done by sector-based approaches, right? So there may be public health approaches around water and sanitation. There may be um, public food uh, approaches around how to feed populations. But really addressing the needs of marginalized populations, particularly around gender-based needs, is incredibly important. So that's work that Oxfam is doing right now, for instance, to really looking at the gendered impacts of COVID, whether that's the exacerbated burdens of unpaid care work on women and girls, whether that's meeting the needs of women health care workers. It's, I think it's something like 90% of the nurses and school teachers around the world are women, right? And we think about where the burden has been placed disproportionately during COVID. It's our nurses, it's our teachers, um, it's our health care workers. It could be grocery store workers, which also happen to be a, a big proportion of women as well. And we know that the risks of gender-based violence are also increasing during COVID because more and more women are forced to stay at home where a lot of violence can be taking place in households. So these are some of the issues that we're thinking about right now that we're really looking at tailored solutions for all around the world. But I just wanted to Sharina, tie that for a moment with the hunger crisis, right? Yeah. Because these are also facing, uh, women are facing a lot of struggles right now to just feed their families. And, you know, sometimes we think about poverty and we think, oh, it's happening so far away all around the world in places that are really far away. In fact, what COVID is bringing home to all of us is that it's happening right here at home too, right? You're seeing this exacerbated in our own homes, in our own towns and communities. Um, my school down the street, uh, that's where a lot of families will come and pick up free meals that they were getting during school, but now with school shut down, we still need to feed families right here in our own communities and towns as well. So we're seeing COVID also really fueling the fires and already, hung, uh, um, already growing hunger crisis here as well. So I just wanted to just, you know, for our audience here, for some of you who are following these issues really well, but for others, just a you know, scene set, before COVID, 821 million people went to bed hungry every night. That's something like one out of nine of us went to bed hungry before COVID hit. Well, we, our research teams have done all the math and we've put out new reporting that suggests that as many as 12,000 people a day could die from hunger, from COVID, if we don't have the type of public policy solutions to address this crisis. So this is the scale and severity we're talking about of a systems-based approach of why this pandemic could really cripple um, our economies, our societies, and our systems. And we know that this is the work, and it's not just Oxfam, it's Agricon Development Network, AKF, UNICEF, and so many of our partners all around the world are working on um, right now. And so I would just say, you know, something for us to think about, Jeremy, you know, you talk about relentless optimism, so let me, let me go back to that and not scare, scare all our audience <laughs> of how bad the world is. You know, some of this, and coming back to what I said earlier, this is solvable. All of these problems are solvable. Even the scale is solvable as well. And it's simple things. You know, if each of our governments, including here in the United States, for instance, fully funded the UN's humanitarian appeal, that's huge progress right there. If we actually focus on building more sustainable food systems, and we have roadmaps for how to do that, that would take us a long way there. If we actually made sure our institutions, as we're building them, are also inclusive of women's participation, women's leadership, and women's voices, that takes us a huge bridge forward. And then finally, I would add, you know, one other thing to think about is really putting pressure on our governments to cancel debt for all low-income countries right now so they can actually afford to put social protection measures in place. You know, these are all steps that we can be taking every single day, our governments, our companies, our leadership can be taking to really help crack this nut of a systems-based approach to both tackle a scale and severity of the problem, but also there's such power because we do have the solutions. We know how to beat this, in fact. We have roadmaps from previous pandemics, and the trick right now is just how do we apply this to scale and how do we work together in different ways to actually do it quicker so we don't cripple economies and we don't cripple our communities as we do that. Well, thank you. Uh, that is a really, really um, helpful place to start. And if I take a few of the themes that you've just laid out, right, there's obviously the, the current pandemic has shined, shown a light 
even more so has exacerbated some of the, the plights that we already had. You, you've started to lay out some of the things that you need to do. So if we shift a little bit and look to this future, you know, how do each of you think that the post COVID world, uh, what, will, what will international development look like? Um, what will that? What will your own organizations do? What do we do? We think we can actually move towards this uh, multi uh, approach as we we think about the post COVID world. Uh, and maybe um, Khalil, you could start this time. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sharina. I mean, um, I think uh, 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 Fatima has raised uh, so many of uh, kind of the issues are implicated now in. Um, uh, in in COVID, in, in a sense, um, uh, COVID, maybe all pandemics come to us kind of in disguise, right? They come disguised as health issues. But actually, once you rip off the mask, what you see is basically every uh, issue that we are dealing with in relation to quality of life at stake here, right? We are seeing um, in what appears to us to be just a kind of a pandemic, a virus, all of a sudden uh, implicating everything from um, food uh, to gender to the marginalization of all kinds of minority groups uh, to obviously this massive educational crisis we're now confronted with. So I guess the first thing I would say in response to your question, I think it uh, the forward agenda and the future of development, I think the first thing that we're going to um, remind ourselves about is that we have to dispense thoroughly with silver bulletism. Mm. Right? There is no silver bullet answer to these issues, right? Um, uh, what we are going to, I think, recommit ourselves to is this idea that the causes of poverty and marginalization are complex and therefore our responses are going to have to be multi-input. We're going to have to look across sectors and across uh, issues and think very hard about how they come together. Uh, but there's no room for um, uh, kind of sloganeering answers, I think, to um, the 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 uh, the issues that are being uncovered uh, and uh, by COVID and that we're being reminded about. So that's one thing. I think the second thing is I think we're going to be in for a real financial crunch. Um, what we are seeing is a crisis that is enveloping uh, the entire world simultaneously. Um, obviously, uh, we are seeing it uh, engulf the developing world. We're seeing it engulf the global north. Um, and uh, the, um, the economic consequences are being felt um, uh, pretty deeply by all quarters. And therefore, I'm really anxious that what we're going to see is a massive pullback uh, from uh, the northern uh, uh, traditional donors uh, in their ability to continue to finance um, their historic commitments uh, to, uh, uh, to global development. And those were already, frankly, uh, commitments which were a, a bit fragile to begin with. So I think that's another thing we're going to have to grapple with, which is what is it going to take for us to keep the issue of global development on the agenda, not only for um, uh, institutions globally, but also for individuals, um, uh, and to remind people that the interdependence of our world requires us uh, to think both about the needs here at home, but also the near needs globally that are ethical commitments don't carry passports. Um, and therefore, we're going to need to be able to uh, think uh, uh, globally about the uh, implications of all of this. And then thirdly, just to come back to my institutional theme, I do think that we're going to have to think very, very broadly about the long-term institutional implications of what we're seeing today. Let me just give you one example. There is a race now globally underway for a scientific response to the virus. And the developing world simply does not have the institutional capacity to participate in that global knowledge race right now. And it's unacceptable because we know that those knowledge resources determine the priorities. They determine the shape of the research. They determine the shape of innovation. And um, uh, one of the areas where I think the other kind of development network has been concerned for many, many years has been, do we have in the developing world, the local uh, locally rooted, globally connected, international standard knowledge resources we're going to need to be able to deal with the current and emerging crises on the terms of the developing world itself. And I think the answer, sadly, is no, we don't. And so I think we're going to have to uh, look at uh, our whole view on how we're going to invest uh, in uh, strong knowledge institutions, strong educational institutions, strong research driven by, equipped by, uh, people from the developing world 
and connected to global knowledge uh, flows uh, emerging from wherever in the world that they may come. Could, could I come yeah. in on one of Khalil's points? So, you know, Khalil, you talked, I really appreciated, you talked about um, anticipating a global financial crisis and just um, having less resources, particularly from the global north, to put in to really addressing the key needs of the pandemic. So I wanted to just build on that point because I think that's probably right. And if we do business as usual, we will fail. And what I mean by that is before COVID hit, we were not able to meet the needs of the world's most urgent humanitarian needs before COVID. We were not able to do that. Many of the UN appeals have gone unfunded to date. There is less and less money coming in from the traditional sources, particularly in the global north for global needs, including in the global south. So what I wanted to offer is what if we think about the system completely differently? Because if we just go to that status quo system, we will fail. We already know that. So what if we turn the system on its head? And what I mean by that is we have a broken humanitarian system today that is 70 years old, that is dictated by a few major governments and donors in the global north to respond to needs globally. We know that that system is broken. COVID actually gives us an opportunity to transform the global humanitarian system on its head. What if we pushed a new system that actually transforms the system by empowering local humanitarian leaders as the frontline workers for humanitarian response, where they have the power, the money, and the resources to respond? And what I mean by that is, instead of from the global north, all the money coming in through these big expensive contract systems where most of the money actually ends up staying in the global north with very few dollars getting pushed out to local organizations. What if we transferred resources, power, and voice to local organizations all around the world that are actually on the front lines of multiple crises who know how to respond, can locally source, locally respond at a fraction of the cost? There are more cost-effective ethical ways and effective ways to save lives and to do business. The incentives haven't been there for us to actually really pursue them in meaningful ways, although the humanitarian community has been trying for the last few years. So this is an opportunity, and I'm really proud that organizations like Oxfam and many others are really pushing now to transform the entire humanitarian response system away from these big global institutions towards local humanitarian leadership. We already have proof even before COVID that this, this is more cost effective, it saves more lives, and it actually puts more frontline workers, particularly women leaders, at the forefront of this crisis. So to me, I would just say, if we're not able to think completely differently about how to respond, we will fall into the same traps we always fall in, where more and more people who are the most marginalized and vulnerable will be trapped and will be unable to respond. But we know we can do better. We know we have a different roadmap for how to get there. And it just takes a collective effort for all of us to think a little differently and devolve our own power, our own money, our own resources away from us to, go to those who are actually on the front lines. Yeah. I think that's a really inspiring um, call to action that you've set out, Fatima. And I know we've talked a lot about institutions um, and, and what that will mean in the future. I do want to take a few minutes and just ask you your opinion on the role of citizen, uh, particularly, you know, in the global north, if you will. Um, so I think you've already highlighted what it could be uh, in some of the, the developing worlds. Any thoughts from you on, you know, for our audience um, who's watching, uh, thoughts on what, what can we do? What can citizens do? And maybe, Jeremy, I'll ask you, because I know you wanted to touch on this um, way in the beginning, you, you mentioned it. Yeah, well, let me let me say a few things. One, um, uh, I'm going to continue my theme. I mean, uh, those of us in this work and citizens supporting this work have got to be relentlessly hopeful and optimistic. We have to be relentless because 2020 keeps coming at us relentlessly, and we cannot give up. I, I'm, you know, I was on a call with my colleagues in Lebanon yesterday, and the UNICEF offices in Beirut were damaged. Uh, we've had UNICEF staff members. Uh, who are who are injured mildly, fortunately, but in the blast and the terrible tragedy in Beirut. 
And the next day, UNICEF was back up again saying, what can we do to help? Handing out brooms to young people who were calling our office saying, how can I help? And we were handing out brooms and shovels for you know these young people to come into the neighborhoods that were affected and help elderly and vulnerable populations to clean out their homes and to make sure they were safe. And we're providing, you know, water. We just got up and we got got moving. And so being relentlessly hopeful and relentless in the pursuit of, of continuing to work. Fatima said it earlier. We've been here before from an international development standpoint. We've taken on big challenges. Uh, you know, UNICEF led the way in the 1980s to increase immunization rates around the world with amazing partnerships from Oxfam and Aga Khan and many others to uh, you know, raise the global vaccination rates from in the 20% to over 80% and, and near 90%. We can tackle big problems um, if we do it well. Um, and I wanna say two other things. One is, this is a little bit back to your former question, but I hope I can tie it to, to the <laughs> current question. That we've gotta, we've gotta collapse what I think has become a false dichotomy between the for-profit world and the non-profit world. Uh, too often we think of the for-profit world unfortunately, is just being driven only by profit motive. And the nonprofit world is sort of this charity beggar model where we have to ask people as beggars for money. That's not the world anymore. The, 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 well, the for-profit world for, for centuries, we know, has always had a public good model. We've gone off course a little bit over the last few decades, and we've got to come back to that because the private sector has to have a role to play. And I'll give an example of that in a minute. The nonprofit world at the same time is moving closer to better business practices, to engaging in different markets, financial markets. And just two quick examples. One, UNICEF is investing in a, a project in the Ivory Coast where a private company, women-led, turns plastic trash into bricks. UNICEF invests in that company. That company makes money. And we, on the, on the, um, at the end of the process, have these bricks and we use to, them to build schools for children. So all of a sudden you're investing in the private market, female-led business, you're investing in children by building schools, and ultimately we're gonna to go to the government and say, you gotta scale this work up. That's the kind of future that we need in terms of all three levels of private sector, public sector, and individual citizens, you know, getting involved in this work. And also we've gotta um, engage the impact investment sector. We've gotta engage not just donors who are giving grants, but also those individuals with wealth who want to set aside a portion of their assets to make an impact, maybe make a small, modest return, but also make a social impact as well. And that's that's really the future, I think, of philanthropy. So, And, and I would just end with individual citizens. I said it before, 6% of philanthropy in the United States goes global. I say all the time, why can't we get to 10%? People say to me, you know, we're gonna, we gotta affect, we gotta give back to our own local community. And I say, absolutely, just give 10 cents on every dollar. And if everybody did that, that would unlock literally tens of billions of dollars for all of our organizations to do this work. And I think we can build a movement where we realize that we've got to invest more in institutions, to Khalil's point, um, that are doing work and that have shown impact. Um, in the in the international development world to address a lot of the issues we've had. So. Fatima, I can see you want to jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, your question is so interesting because, you know, we're having this conversation against the backdrop of movements here in the United States and all around the world to push for radical social justice and social change. And so when you ask the question of what can citizens do, what can't citizens do, right? What can't we do if, if, if we're committed to a world that doesn't have poverty and that is completely attainable within our lifetime? What can't we do, right, for this change? And so just to say that um, for me, the most exciting thing, even the last three months of watching uh, here in the United States, all the different social justice movements that have been taking place, is that citizens here are calling for transformational change. But we're tired of step changes along the way. We want new radical changes today and tomorrow, and we need new leadership in places all around the world to help us get there. And so I love this idea of ending about talking about we're all part of a global movement. We're all part of something bigger than each of us. It's, it's happening in our homes, in our communities, in our towns, in our countries, and all around the world. 
And, you know, I hope what we see is this transformative change that really lifts up, that puts social justice at the heart of this. And wherever you are in the world, it means something very powerful to you, what social justice change looks like. And for me personally, that shifting power, knowledge, resource, and voice from those of us, you know, who have taken up a lot of power and space in the international global north to those all around the world that really know best, know their communities the best, and um, actually have all the tools at their disposal. If, if, if sometimes we just get out of the way, right, for them to be able to do it. So, you know, Khalil talked about that it's not fair for those all around the world to not be part of um, the solution set on this vaccine. Well, that's, that's the fight of our lives right now is this transformative social justice change. So whether it's a global health crisis, whether it's an education crisis, a hunger, gender crisis, or if it's all of the above, which is what I think we're seeing right now to Khalil's point, that we're in it together. And so I just think it's such a profound movement uh, moment right now. And just to say, especially for those that are watching that are the, the younger generation on this, um, on this call right now, just like the power is in their hands right now to help us think differently and shape this differently and transform it really. And I'm just really inspired by everything everyone's doing every single day as part of that global movement. So it's just been, and that's, I think that's what inspires me every single day to keep doing this work. Um, and it's and it's completely doable. So Jeremy, I'm gonna be a relentless optimist alongside, <laughs> alongside the three of you. Well, Shreen, I'm I'm uh, 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 I'm taken by both Jeremy and um, uh, uh, Fatima's uh, kind of calls to action, and it's hard not to resist um, uh, joining them. Uh, before I do that, I might just make one point, though, which is that I do think that uh, uh, we are also amidst uh, very ominous forces at play in our world. Um, that there is, in fact, a battle. I think, uh, at least intellectual, uh, if not practical, between those who want us to think that we should only be in it for ourselves rather than us being um, all in this together. And I think you ask, what does it take from citizens? Well, I do think there is a cognitive demand on citizen. You know, we, we bandy this word, word uh, global citizenship around, but let's be clear what kind of transformation that requires on all of our parts, it seems to me at least, because the notion of citizen is to kind of draw a boundary around a political community. I'm a citizen, you are not. When we ask to, us to think about us as global citizens, we're asking ourselves to erase that boundary that we usually think about as the fraternity of citizenship and redraw it to encompass all of humanity. That's a big ask for people. And I think it's absolutely required it's absolutely what we're being called to do today, that the call for inclusion that Fatima talked about earlier, um, uh, this idea of what we would kind of uh, talk about uh, as pluralism, that um, our uh, human community is full of difference, and that is a blessing and a gift. And it will be one of the great questions for the future of humanity, whether we are able to leverage and understand that difference as a gift, whether we're able to see it as actually an engine for our common um, advance and fulfillment uh, as a planet, rather than seeing them as divisions to be fought over. And I do think that is uh, a cognitive challenge for us. I think it is a it raises a whole set of practical challenge. But at the end of the day, I think it is most importantly an ethical challenge. Because at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is our ethic of relationship to each other as fellow humans in a global community. And uh, I come back to that because I think it is a case for all of our institutions. It's certainly a case for the institution of the Other Kind Development Network that at this core, there is an ethical commitment to what it means to live as a shared humanity, to be able to give to each other and to receive from each other. That support we need, all of us need, not just people over there who are poor, all of us need, right? The support that all of us need to be able to live a life of peace and prosperity um, and, uh, and fellowship with each other. And so I just say that uh, I think it demands a lot from citizens. We are asking a lot of each other. The crisis is uh, 
uh, is yet again uh, bringing into sharp relief uh, these demands. And um, of course, there are countless acts of hope everywhere. Every time we've seen a fragility in this crisis, we have seen at least um, uh, another act of hope, of a community coming forward, of individuals coming forward. And I think it's up to us now. Will the, will the hope prevail or will the fragility prevail? Um, His Highness uh, 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 had this beautiful phrase where he said that, you know, instability is infectious, but so is hope. And I think our job now is to see if we can globally marshal our resources to support the forces of hope over the forces of instability. Great. Uh, that is an outstanding call to action from all of you. Uh, one last question uh, before we run out of time. Um, just you know, picking up on your theme around His Highness, at the um, International Development Conference in Washington, D.C. in 1987, His Highness, uh, who is the chairman of the Aga Khan Development Network, in his keynote address spoke um, about the critical role of an enabling environment for development. And he said, and I quote, uh, neither profit uh, or nor not-for-profit ventures can fully be effective, which we've already talked about, uh, in serving societies unless there exists what I call an enabling environment for development. I would love to get your thoughts on, on this notion of an enabling environment, and especially as we think about future partnerships and the coming together of citizens, government, businesses, private, uh, you know, profit, non-profit, uh, for the overall betterment of society. Um, so I'd love to just get your your last parting thoughts on that um, before before we have to end. And maybe uh, Jeremy, you can uh, kick us off. Yeah, thank you for this this great question. I think I would answer it by saying we just simply as a, and and it's going to pick up on the, the great points that Khalil is just making. We just simply cannot retreat. Um, and by that, I mean, we cannot retreat as individual citizens just into our own homes, even though physically we're having to do that a lot lately. We cannot retreat as, as local and state and, and national governments into our own borders and only focus on what's happening in our own borders. We don't have that choice. Why not? Because we have issues that cannot be a solve but for multilateral uh, discourse, discussion, compromise and planning. And just to name two big ones, climate issues and the global migrant challenge, which I know we haven't talked a lot about, but when you've got 50 million children on the run as we do today, more than any time since World War II, we've got a world where not one country can solve that because inherently you've got uh, populations moving from one country to a second country, sometimes to a third country, stateless, living in these uh, camps oftentimes without rights, oftentimes, unfortunately, for generations. And those are issues that we cannot retreat into our own borders and solve. Now is the time to invest in institutions um, that are doing the hard work of reaching across borders, reaching across neighborhoods, and saying to someone who might be unfamiliar to you, or who might have different values, or who might speak a different language, and saying to them, I can't solve this myself, and I know you can't either. So while we might not have the same solution coming into this conversation, let's come out of the conversation with a solution. And I would just end with, you know, for me, tying together something that Fatima said earlier, we've got thousands, I think she said, of billionaires in the world. And I told the story of Safa, whose only dream at one point in her life was to have a bed. And I think we've got to build that ethic of, we just cannot abide a world where there is so much gracious plenty and there's even one child hoping that he or she will have a bed to sleep at night. I think there's room to build that global citizenship ethic, which will be difficult. You're, you're, you're absolutely right, Khalil, around some basic decency principles of how we want to treat each other as human beings and to help the most vulnerable among us, um, in our case at UNICEF, particularly children, to everyone to be able to achieve achieve their dreams and, uh, and every opportunity that they want. Thank you. Fatima? Well, you know, I'm really thinking about your question because I'm wondering what does it look like when we don't have an enabling environment? And I'm actually wondering if that's what our lives feel like right now for many of us, where we can't figure out schools, 
We're work, we can't figure out how to get to our jobs. We can't even figure out sometimes how to get groceries or how to get our basic goods. You know, the things that nine months ago, at least I took for granted in my daily life, um, are now like basic challenges and things, you know? And it's making me wonder when you don't have leadership, when you don't have active citizenry, when you don't have institutions that are functioning at the highest levels, what does the world look like? Does it look like a little <laughs> bit of what it looks like right now in the world? And, you know, for that sobering thought, it also makes me realize how incredibly momentous this moment, uh, how incredibly important this moment is that we're living in because, you know, somebody started this conversation, I think it was you, Jeremy, with a fork in the road and which fork we want to take. Well, let me just say, I think we have no choice but to take the fork where we rise above this, where we do come together, where we do act as global citizens, where we invest in our current and our new future local institutions, and we, we bring back the meaning of leadership, leadership at local levels, national levels, international levels. And, and you know, that's where, to me, the global citizenry conversation really comes into play. Because each of us, you know, I started out an hour ago talking about poverty is a choice. It's a choice that each of us make, right? We either, in the, in the, in the um, politicians we elect, in the taxes we choose to pay, in the companies we choose to buy from, we make choices every single day of the type of world we want to be part of. I, I think today is a moment of profound choice for each of us as individuals right now. What kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a world that is interconnected, where we get to really live in the best and take the best of each of our places and diversity of thought and, and products and goods to be the best that we can be? Or do we want to retreat into our own individual isolated places? Um, and I think we've all seen exactly how this plays out over the last six months or so and what the world could look like and the choices we have to make. So. You know, to me, it's as we think about the next six months, the next year, wherever we live in the world, whether it's here in the United States, in Canada, or anywhere you live around the world, we have profound choices as citizens that we need to be making. And I think if there's ever a call of what it means to be a global citizen, it's today. And exercising that authority, that vote, that voice, it could be where you shop from, it could be where you vote, right? It could be the choices that we each, each of us make. But we cannot keep living in a world where a few people get to dictate the choices and options for the rest of us. It's ethically wrong, it's immoral, and we all see the profound consequences when that happens. So to me, it's more important than ever that we get back our enabling environments and we build back better. Um, and not just to the status quo, which wasn't working for so many of us anyway, but really building back better to a future that we know we can see and we can grasp, but we have some hard work to do to, to kind of get there. Great. Khalil, any parting thoughts? Um, well, look, um, you know, uh, I think uh, this idea that His Highness put out uh, in 1987 that we all have to just kind of work together seems to be uh, like exactly the recipe for what we need to do now. It, it could be the theme of our conversation. You know, we used to think uh, about um, um, innovation. Uh, we talked about innovation, that innovation was the product of kind of solo geniuses in their labs, right? Individual you know, geniuses sitting in his or her lab coming up with these brilliant ideas. Um, we now know, I think we now understand that that's not what innovation is. Innovation is actually a property of a system of institutions interacting with each other from lot different parts of society in an ongoing, reliable way. And when that happens, all kinds of magic can, um, can result. Uh, we come up with new ways of um, being with each other, working with each other, solving problems with each other. That's what's being called for now. Um, is that we are all kind of pulled together. Um, th there's this uh, great uh, German play by Brecht where there's this uh, exchange between two of the uh, characters and, and the, the one character says, you know, sad is the land that has no heroes. And the response is no, sad is the land that needs heroes. We don't need heroes. We need reliable institutions and systems that whether you are living in a valley in remote Afghan Badakhshan, or you are a kid in downtown Seattle, that you have the support system you need, knowing that we're all pulling for you and all rooting for you, that that set of institutions and that ethic underlying each of our engagements with each other is gonna support you to reach your aspirations and goals. 
that requires us all to pull together. That is an enabling environment. Well, thank you. Um, super inspiring. Uh, I want to thank you all for taking your time and sharing with us uh, really, really amazing insights. I'm certainly taking away relentless optimism. Uh, all of this is solvable. Um, and we all just can do it by pulling together each one of us as individuals and many institutions across. So thank you, thank you, thank you for the time today um, and for spending it with each other. So thank you very much. Thank you, really great. Thank you, thank you, Sharina. And thank you, Khalil, Jeremy and Fatima for enlightening us with the critical work of your organizations, especially during these challenging times. In today's environment, the work of these organizations is critical. Issues uh, of poverty, environment, health, economic and social issues, gender and, and racial bias need to be spotlighted and eradicated from the face of this world to make it what it was always meant to be, God's gift to humanity. On behalf of the Smiley Jamaat Kanat and Center, thank you for joining. <laughs>